right, the imperfect family. If you got your Bibles, if you got your Bibles, go to Ephesians 5. We're still in Ephesians 5. Uh, we've been studying this series on the imperfect family uh, because, listen, we are all imperfect people uh, in an imperfect world serving a perfect God, and we are in imperfect families. Your family is not perfect. I know that you think other families around you are. I know social media tells us that there's perfect families and all that, but there's not. There's no perfect families because there's no perfect people. And so we're studying our roles and how we can be more Christ-centered in our homes, and we've been studying out of Ephesians 5. Last week, Dean gave a great message to all of us um, about learning to walk, and, and we said about walking in our walking out our relationship with Christ, and we celebrated our, our seniors. We had some of our graduates here this morning. They look more like adults. Alan over here, I said, hey man, you look like an adult. You graduated last night. He goes, man, I woke up, my knees were hurting. I was like, you're an adult. I said, pretty soon your back's going to be hurting. You're getting there, buddy. You're getting there. So let's, uh, let's start. Now, before we go, let's remember that everything we're studying in Ephesians 5, 22, Two through 30 is under this banner or this umbrella of gratitude and submission. Okay, let's look at, uh, look at verses uh, 20 and 21. We, we have to know the context here, okay? Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, we are to always be grateful for where we are in life. No matter what season we're in, whether we don't want to be in this season or we're in a season that we're enjoying or we're in a season that we don't like, we always, the first thing that we should do as believers in Jesus, now if you're in the room and you're a non-believer, I understand, I wouldn't be grateful for things either. But when Jesus comes in your life and you accept him as your Savior, everything changes. And we're going to start talking about that. And the first thing we do is we be grateful. We be grateful. Men, be grateful for your families. Because there was a time when you prayed for this family. And you got all of it. <laughs> all right? You got all of it. Verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we talked about that idea of submission. Being considering. Submission is considering others over uh, more important than yourselves. Considering others. So it's calling all of us. Male, female, children, grandparents, aunts, uncles. Anybody, and when we keep talking about the family, remember we're also talking about the church family. We are called to submit as believers, submit to one another, putting others before ourselves because that's what Christ did for us. The book of Ephesians, this whole book, is talking about if we accept the gospel as our Savior, it's written to believers, then this is the new life we're allowed to live. And what happens when we know Christ is our Savior, it changes so many things in our lives. It changes relationships, right? It changes the relationships we have in church. It changes the relationship. We are set apart and we are different because of the gospel, because of Jesus. And it changes our relationships with our spouses, our spouse, our relationship should be different. It changes our relationship with our children. It should be different. It changes our relationship at work and how we view work. It literally changes everything. And that's what the book of Ephesians kind of works us through. So now, week one, we talked about the wife. We talked about the wife, and we talked about how the Lord has called her uh, and, and called the woman to be a helper. And that's not beneath or below, but that's beside in working together. Last week, we talked about children. Children, obey your parents. Obey your parents. I thought it was really cute that Deed was teaching about cross, and, and he's one years old, and he's teaching about him dropping food. That was a great story, Deed. But I have teenagers. It's a different type of obedience now, okay? All right? I'll tell you how you do I put a shock collar on my kids when they were that age and just buzzed them. All right? They, no, I never did that. I never did that. Thought about it, but never did it. And today we're talking about husbands. We're talking about husbands, okay? We're talking about men. We're talking about men in the room. Now, men, men, whether you like it or not, you're a leader. You're a leader, whether you like it or not. Now, I know some of you are like, well, next week's Father's Day. Why didn't you talk about this on Father's Day? Well, it didn't line up in the calendar, one. And two, I like giving it this week. Here's why. There's three Sundays. There's three Sundays in church world that you're guaranteed to have big crowds. The first one is Easter. You're going to have a big crowd on Easter, right? The second one is Mother's Day, right? 
And you're like, okay, is the third one Father's Day? Nope. It's the second weekend in November. I don't know why, but the second weekend in November will be Father's Day. All right? So I'm giving this message today, okay? All right? So that does not mean you can miss on Father's Day. You need to be here on Father's Day because we're going to talk about the other roles in our families, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, the other roles within the family. But listen, how the father goes, how the father goes, the family goes. You're the leader whether you like it or not, men. You just are. Statistics are overwhelmingly, overwhelming that the spiritual health of the father is so, is so reflected by the spiritual health of the family. Now, there's a statistic that I read years ago, and I don't have it. I look for the picture. I don't have the statistic, so I'm going to give it to you. You're going, how do you know these statistics are right? I know that 90% of all statistics are wrong, so I know that this falls in that, okay? But I know that this is very clear because I've seen it in ministry, all right? I've seen it in ministry. But this statistic I read years ago said that if a child comes to church and gives their life to Christ and is baptized and starts wanting to be committed to the church, that it's an 11% chance that that entire family will come to that church, that that entire family will come to know Christ and be following, be disciples of Christ. 11%. If it's the mother, the mother who is the spiritual leader and she comes to church, she gets saved, she gets baptized, the whole family coming and following her is 33% which is it's better than 11, right? If it's the father, it's almost 90%. 90%. Fathers, you're the leader of your home, whether you know it or not. Men, you're the leader, whether you know. If you say, I don't feel like a leader, you're a leader. And you're called to lead. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That's what we're going to talk about today, is leading, men, is leading. Here's my prayer for you guys, though. Here's my prayer before we go any further for men. Is this, and I wrote it because I wanted to to pray it correctly. You ready? Men, that you would use and leverage the authority that God has given you in whatever aspect of your life, whatever area of your life, that you would use and leverage the authority that God has given you using the gifts and the strengths for the sake of everyone around you, for the glory of God. At a great expense for yourself. That's, what, that's how we're called to lead. Why is that the prayer? Because that is what Jesus did. That is what Jesus did and who he is. Now for the ladies, we did an acronym, if you remember, HELPER. If you remember HELPER, the acronym. And we talked about what helpers are, and I'll go through them real quick. H was that women are, we're called to hope in God. We're called to, you're called to hope in God. E is encouragement. Your words matter. L is lavish. P is pray, E is empower, and R was respect. So for the men, I wanted to use an acronym too, but I knew y'all couldn't remember that many letters, so we just went with lead. Okay? I almost just went with L. No. <laughs> but we're going to talk about lead, and there's a, there's a very popular acronym about leading, and it's called listen, learn, encourage, uh, listening and learning, account, encourage, accountability, and deliver, okay? So that's, a, that's, that's an acronym. Now, ours is going to be really different, and it's going to be based out of this scripture. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to read the scripture together, and then we're going to work through the acronym that we find lead out of here, all right? So in verse 22, if you've got the Word of God, let's read it together. It says, Wives, submit, your, uh, submit to your own husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated, uh, no one ever had hatred his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does the church. 
because we are members of his body. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. Stop right there. When I was reading this this week, something really jumped out at me when it says in verse 32, this mystery is profound. Paul wrote that right after he talked about husbands leaving, uh, men leaving their home, wives leaving their home and becoming one. This is what the Lord kind of said to me, and I just want to share it with you. If you're in a marriage in here, and your marriage is holy and righteous and serving the Lord and doing what it can to glorify the Lord, and I brought you up here and said, tell us what you're doing. You may be able to say a few things. You may be able to say, here's what we do together. But in all honesty, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. I ain't got no clue how me and her get along so well. She is so different than me. Her relationship with Jesus is different than me. It is so different. And, and husbands and wives in this room that are married, don't feel inadequate because you don't know how it's working. Just praise God that it's working. Because it's a mystery. Because here's the mystery. Here's the mystery. How are two people that are so sinful and selfish sacrificing for one another? Here's the same mystery. How, would, how in the world would a God in heaven see a sinful people that don't just sin one time, but continually sin over and over and still be willing to give his son to die on the cross for us? That makes no sense. The greatest theologian, many say, Paul was like, it's a mystery, I don't get it. Listen, our job is we don't have to know all the answers, we just have to know the one who has all the answers. And so many times we feel like we got to know how, we got to know how, we got to know how. Sometimes you're just not going to know how, you just got to surrender it to Christ and just say, thank God for what he's doing. This mystery is profound, and I, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in his church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see uh, see that she respects her husband. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your truth. Lord, I pray now today that it's your words that speak. It's your words that lead us and teach us, Jesus. We pray that we focus fully on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I told you a couple weeks ago that I was very nervous and walking a tightrope as I was biblically talking about the roles of women and in, in, in what women in church and wives and all that. Now I'm going to tell you, to be honest with you, stepping into this week talking about husbands and leadership, I want to tell you how I felt. I have felt very disqualified. I, I have. In full transparency, as I study this and as we go through these acronyms, I am not a good husband. I am not a good father. I am not a good leader or pastor. But what I am is a sinner saved by a beautiful, wonderful Savior named Jesus. And I'm at his feet every day begging him to teach me and help me. And that's what we're all called to be. So as I teach today, I don't want you to sit here and go, well, what he's saying he don't do. You're right. <laughs> but I'm getting before God begging him to help me. Does that make sense? So men, before we go any further, I'm not beating anybody up today. Men, do not sit here and be like, here we go, he's going to be talking. I'm not beating you up. I'm encouraging you to say, I'm failing in a lot of these things. Let's strive after Jesus together. Let's do this together, men. Let's go after him. Let's lead well, men. Let's do this together. Ladies, I want you to keep your elbows in today. The only chicken wings we need tonight are from wings to go, okay? You don't be elbowing your husband today. He knows. I told the first service, I said, don't get in the car today, ladies, and be like, what would you think, Brian, when he said this? You know, don't do that. Let it marinate, okay? Let him talk about it, all right? But I come before you humbly saying, let's seek after Jesus together. Here's the, here's the first and foremost thing to all men, all women, all children, all teenagers, everybody in this room. Here's the first call on every one of our lives within a family. Is the first call is for us to humbly submit our lives to Jesus Christ and surrender our lives fully to him and seek after him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. That's the greatest calling you have in your life. If you don't hear anything else today, husbands, men... Surrender your life to Jesus Christ and seek after him with everything you've got. And the rest will fall into place. All right? So here's the first one. Let's go with L. Let's go with L. Now, 
You remember the acronym I told you, the famous one that uh, the leadership talks about all the time is, is to learn and listen. I was praying through that, and I was like, you know what? I kept reading the scripture. I kept going, that's not it. Here's, here's what L is. Lavishly love. Now, I know I told the ladies the same thing. You're like, okay, you're doing the... No, it's different. Lavishly love the people around you. Just as Christ did. Christ did this. Therefore, we are called to do this. You cannot lead different than the greatest leader to ever walk the face of the earth. The man named Jesus. In Ephesians 1, Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Listen, the greatest need from the people around you, your children, your wife, your employees, the people in your community, your friends, the greatest need that they have around you as a man is for you to lavishly love them. Out-love people. Out-love people. Love them more than they love you. Respect them more than they respect you. Consider them more than they consider you. Why? You're like, why would I do that? Because it's what Jesus did to you. It's what Jesus has done for you. He's lavishly loved you. He loved you when you were unlovable. When you didn't love him, he loved you. Listen, last week in in Ephesians 5, if you go back and read Ephesians 5, a lot of it's talking about sacrificial love. It's talking about, uh, it says right there in verse 2, the the offering of to a sacrifice. Lavish love is a sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. Do you sacrificially love your family? Do you sacrificially love the people around you? Now, real quick, I want to tell you two things. What is sacrificial love? Here's the first thing. What sacrificial love is not? Sacrificial love is not abusive. It's not abusive. Okay? And here's what I mean. Men, we can fall into this. I can fall into this. We can, I'm being sacrificial. I'm doing everything for the family. I'm I'm working long hours. I'm doing all I can, and nobody's giving me appreciation. Nobody's telling me good job. Nobody's respecting me. Well, it's not sacrificial love anymore if you need that. Y'all realize that? Y'all realize when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't stop for a moment and go, Hey, guys, see what I'm doing? (laughs) Somebody take a picture. Post it on Instagram. No, he didn't do that. He did it. He did it without any sacrificial love. Is not needing that. It, by definition, it's not sacrificial love anymore. If you're using what you do to hang over people, that's not sacrificial love. If your sacrificial love is causing you to become angry and aggressive and frustrated, it's not sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is seriously putting others before yourself. Here's what sacrificial love is too. Sacrificial love is not abusive. And sacrificial love is not passive. It is not a passive love. God, Listen, God wants us as men and husbands to be actively involved in the spiritual and physical and mental life of those around us. Especially our families. Listen, we are called to, be cons- to, to work and be active in their relationships. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians 5. 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Is any of that passive? Is any of that standing on the sideline? No, that's actively being involved in the lives of those around you. Listen, if your wife or your kids would come and say this thing, hey, he doesn't talk, he doesn't care, he doesn't listen, he doesn't open up, he doesn't let me in, he just shuts me out, he doesn't help around the house, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not part of our home, he's not even chasing me, he's not actively pursuing me, he's not giving me attention, then you are being passive. You are being passive. You are not being what God has called you to be in your home. He's not. Now, men, let's talk. I'll be honest with you. It's what we do, though. It's our default, right? It's what we do. It's just easier to to step back. Escapism is an epidemic in our culture. Men, we escape. We escape as quick as we can. 
We, 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 we pull back. We hide. It's what we do. We all do it. Let's just be honest. That's not sacrificial love. That's not the love that we're called to lavish upon our family. We need to be present where we are. Listen, fellas, your wife is the prize. Chase her. Chase her. Chase her. Here, I'm going to give you a little... I'm going to give you a little help. Everybody, if you're a man, take notes right now. You're not going to do it, but take notes, okay? All right, if you're, if you're a young guy and you don't have a wife yet, listen, here's, I'm going to help you out, okay? Look, Eli's got his pen out. He's ready to go. All right. The three Ds are what you need to do, men. Every day, once a week, and once a month, okay? First D, every day you need to dial her in. Dial her in, husbands. Here's how you dial her in. Send her an encouraging text. Tell her she's beautiful. Tell, tell her thank you for what you did this morning. Tell her don't send, don't don't the only text she gets from you is what's for dinner. Okay. <laughs> Literally, dial her in. Say things. Here here's another one. Here's another one I, I try to do. When I come in the door, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Or she comes in the door, she's tired, exhausted. Grab her and hug her. Just hug her. Hug her. Just hug her. Just mess with her. Dial her in. Number two, the next one. Once a week, that's that's daily. Once a week, date her. Date her. And some of you are like, oh, well, that must be nice to have time for a date night. We don't have time for no date night. We got three. No, I think it's three kids. We got, I think, three kids. It's always other people. Out. We got, we don't have time for it. We're busy. But you know what we do? Hey, can I take 15 minutes? Hey, let's take 15 minutes and sit and talk. Like, like hey, Let's go on a date this week. What are we gonna do? We're gonna pick the garden together, and we go do. We, let's go for a walk together. We even let's cut the TV off and just sit and talk. And me and you're like, oh, I don't know what to talk about. Don't just listen. <laughs> but date her, and you're like, well, okay, I'll do. No, but ask her. Like ask her, just like you did when you first wanted to be with her, right? You constantly asked her out, right? Ask her. Hey, can we take a walk together? Hey, can we sit together? Can we talk? The last day, you right? Depart. Depart. Now, the guy who told me this, he says, once a month I take my wife out of town. That, I can't do that. Oh, I can't afford it to our, our lifestyle. Does. So we depart. We call it crossing county lines. Sometimes we call it crossing enemy lines. But <laughs> we, we call it crossing county lines. We, we go away. Even if it's just for a morning once a month. A couple months ago, she said, hey, I want to go pick up some antique doors from Salisbury. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> and that was our departure. We drove to Salisbury, we got antique doors, and we drove back. It was thrilling. <laughs> but it was great because we connected. We got to talk. We got to spend time together. Depart. If it, drive into Pittsburgh to get coffee, drive into Hillsborough. Drive, even if you're like, why? We can't do that. Depart from your everyday. Just say, hey, we're going to take... This night, we're going to go walk at this park. Just, just be intentional. Listen, be active. Here's the thing. Sacrificial love is active. Sacrificial love is active. It is seeking. It is seeking those around it to know that they are loved. Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, he didn't just do it. He actively is seeking us still today so that we know his love and grace and know who he is. The E, all right? We got L down, right? E, encouragement or empowerment? Encouragement or empowerment? Husband, men, to be Christ-like and to love Christ-like like, likeness. The people around you and your wives and those that are in your circle are going to be physically, mentally healthier. If you encourage them and empower them. Put up Ephesians 5.29. When you go back and study what we just read, Ephesians 5.29 says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it. Now, some of you would stop real quick and go, What are you talking about? We live in a culture right now where people hate their body, body image issues and all that. He is talking to believers right here. Does that make sense? And when we believe in Jesus Christ and we know who he is, then we should be happy with who he's created us to be. Amen? And as we struggle, all of us are working through that struggle with it. We should be happy with the temple that he's given us, and we should work to, to keep it healthy, and, and we like it. So therefore, we should do the same thing to our wives. We should look to help and love and cherish and nourish them. 
And before you're like, okay, you're telling us to, I gotta go join a gym with her. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about are you an encourager or a criticizer? And seriously, man, are you an encourager or a criticizer? Man, if I talk to your five closest friends and your family, would they say that you talk more about empowering, encouraging people around you or criticizing them? Are you the smartest man in the world? Can no one do what you can do? Are you the best? Because we all know those men, right? Just get out of the way, let me do it. I'm the best at it. That's not encouraging. That's not empowering. If your kids are constantly hearing you criticize other people and other men and that, that's not Christ-likeness. That's not what we're called to do. We're, we're called to use words to empower people. Let me ask you, when you walk into a room, do you reduce or induce the stress level of the room? Are you a peace robber or bring peace? Are you a killjoy or do you bring joy? Do you stir up anxiety or do you calm everyone? Do you burden Or do you empower and love? Listen, your family was never intended to be in a home that walks on eggshells because they don't want to upset you. That's not encouraging and empowering, and that's not Christ-likeness. It's not. It's not. I got a question. When's the last time you spoiled the people around you? When's the last time you complimented somebody? This week, we were down at the, the, am I allowed to say beach or coast, Pastor? I think, I, we go to the beach, but I know some Christians only go to the coast. We go to the beach. Anyway, so I was down at the beach, and this guy had his truck, and it was so clean. I mean, it was unbelievable. Y- y'all know the guys that their truck are always just spotless? I mean, it's perfect. Like, you see your reflection in the grill. And I saw his truck, and I was like, hey, man, that truck looks good. And he was like, thanks. And that's so how I was like, man. And, and that's the way my boys laugh because that's the way I always try to share the gospels. I try to compliment people because nobody hates the person that compliments them, right? Nobody walks away going, what a jerk. He likes my truck. So I'm like, man, that truck is clean. And I went, I know you work hard on it. Well, the moment I said, I know you work hard on it, he was like, oh, I really do. <laughs> When's the last time you complimented somebody, man? Women, no, honestly, you're a believer in Jesus Christ. When's the last time you complimented somebody? We're supposed to share joy and love, right? When Do you use your words to criticize or empower? Do you compliment? Here's a, uh, when's the last time you said thank you? When's the last time you said thank you? I went to visit a family here at the church, and they got two little boys, and it was, I man, it encouraged me so much, because I was talking to the little boys and to the family, and, and the dad kept saying, what do you say? And they would say, thank you, and I was like, oh, man, that, it just encouraged me so much. But then I started thinking, as adults, do we stop saying thank you? When's the last time you just said thank you? Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. That's encouraging. That's empowering. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such that is good for building up as fit the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear it. Do your words bring grace to those people around you? Do they build people up? A. A. First one, lead was love lavishly. E. We want to encourage and empower. A. Accountability. Accountability and to act. Accountability and to act. Men, I want to let you know you are responsible for your homes and your family. Like it or not, you will one day stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and you will give an account for how you ran your home, how you ran. Here, you're going, here's the first thing, men, you need to realize too. You're going to stand before the Holy God and you're going to give account for how you ran yourself. And normally how you run yourself is going to show us how you're running your family. Are, are you taking responsibility, men? Are you taking responsibility? When it says in the word, words here, it says, um, let's look back at it. It says, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle in such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. If that's what Christ is doing for us, isn't that what we should be doing for those around us? Doing all that we can so that we are being held accountable, understanding that they are our responsibility. See, the greatest sin that we struggle with men is that we don't want to take responsibility and we don't want to be accountable. All right, 
Here we go. Genesis 3. Anybody know what happened in Genesis 3? It's called the fall, right? Genesis 1, 2. God makes this beautiful earth. Everything's wonderful. It's perfect. He creates man. And then he was like, man, man he's a helper. I'm going to create woman. She come out, went wearing clothes. He went, whoa, man. And now she's a woman. All right? Some of you will get that joke later. Okay? All right? And then they're walking in the garden together. And they're spending time together. And then God said, you can do anything you want to, but you can't eat this apple. You can't eat from this, this tree. You can't eat this apple tree. And then, so they're walking around, and all of a sudden, curiosity got going. They're like, and then the snake shows up. And the snake's like, he doesn't want y'all to know good and evil. He starts being deceptive and, 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 and tricking them and seducing them. And then what happens? The fall happens. But what happens in the fall? The woman went over, she grabbed the apple, right? And she bit the apple, right? So was the first sin her biting the apple, or was the first sin the fact that Adam just stood there and said nothing? Men, our sin is our passivity. Our sin is that we don't act. Our, our sin is that we allow sin and things to fall around us. Men, we are called to step up. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14 says, Be on guard. Stand firm in your faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. One version of scripture says right there, it says, be courageous, strong. It said, be a man. We are called to stand. We are called to fight for our families, for our church. We are called to fight in prayer the way God has called us to, to humbly, humbly, humbly lead our families well. And stand there. And when we see sin come into our home, we should be the first one at the door saying, no, 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 no not here. That's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to do. But here's the thing. We're passive, and we allow it to happen. And then once we allow it to happen, we don't want no one to call us out on it. So we hate accountability. We run from accountability. At this church, we do man church. Three to four times a year, we meet on a Sunday night, we pray, we worship together, and we study the Word together. But then we also have man church groups that meet every other Wednesday night. And it's a group of men that get together and they pray and they read the word and they support one another. And you're like, I ain't going to none. I ain't sitting around talking about my feelings. Well, you haven't been to one of our groups because it's inappropriate until I walk in normally. They sit around and talk about stuff that you, they're men, right? But they're holding each other accountable. And they're praying for their families. And they're studying the word together. Men, the first thing Satan wants to do is isolate you. I read a quote one time. It said, a man who is not accountable to anyone is a danger to himself. Man, we are called to be accountable to each other. We're, taking man, we're going on man camp. We got man camp. If you haven't signed up for man camp, you need to sign up for man camp. And said, can you put that slide up there? In September, we're going up into the mountains of West Virginia, where men are from. <laughs> and we're going to go whitewater rafting. If you can't whitewater raft, you don't want to, you can go up with us and stay with us. Some, group, some guys are going to go hiking and everything. But we're going up into the mountains of West Virginia. We're going to spend uh, three days, two nights together. And we're going we're gonna to be around men, holding each other accountable, building relationships, laughing having a good time. You, listen, first and foremost thing, I know most of you men are going, I ain't sharing a room with nobody. You don't have to. You can get your own little room so nobody can see your facial cream at night. <laughs> That's just me. But we're going to man camp. You need, if, you're not, if you're not involved in anything in our church with men, men if you're not, you need to go sign up for this immediately because it'll change your life. But I seriously saying you need men. Mark 2, you need men in your life. You need men not only to encourage you, you need men to hold you accountable. Because when you act or don't act, you need men right there. D, the last one, you need to disciple your family. We are called, we are called, all of us in this room are called to love God, love people, and make disciples. We are called to love God, Love people and make disciples. If we are not making disciples in our home, then what are we doing? What are we doing? 
Let's look, look at First Peter. I've got it up on the screen. First Peter five six through eleven. If you if you're if you're sitting here and you go, Brian, I don't even know where to start in making disciples. Here's the first thing you do in making disciples. You need to make sure that you are seeking after Jesus with all your heart. It needs to be about you chasing after Jesus. You want to disciple your family? You need to chase after Jesus. And they will see it. Study this word this week right here. 1 Peter 5, 6-11 says, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that at the same kind of suffering that is being, that is being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Stop right there. Listen, men, this is why church is so important. This is why men's groups are so important. Because the first thing the enemy wants to do, as he is circling your home, as the enemy is circling your life, the first thing he wants to tell you is that you're all alone. That no one knows and no one understands what you're going through. And this scripture tells us right here that the suffering that you're going through, the other brothers in Christ are experiencing the same thing. That's why church and men's group are so important. You want to, you want to disciple your family? You show your family the priority that you put on being in the house of the Lord, seeking God. Not only church, but seeking Him in your own home. How scripture is valuable to you. How your prayer time is important. Because that's the thing. Is he wants to isolate. Look at verse 10. And after you have suffered for a little while. In God and all of his grace. Who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. With himself. Will himself restore. Confirm. Strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever. And ever. Listen, the people in your life around you, they know you whether you think they do or not. They know whether you're seeking after Christ. On my tombstone, I've always told Jessica, on my tombstone, I want written, here lies a man whose friends and family and those closest to him knew he really loved Jesus. Because I can fool all of you, but the people in my own home, I can't fool them. They know whether I'm getting after it seeking after Jesus. They know whether I'm praying. They know whether I'm studying the word. Listen, there, there's something that I've been very intentional in my house about doing that, that I don't know if my children know it or my wife knows it. So if y'all that are in the room that are related to me, don't listen. For, they don't listen anyway. So there's a chair in my house. And beside that chair is my prayer journal and my Bible. And I... I, I go to that chair to read the Word of God, to write every morning in my journal, to seek after Him at night. And after hard days, I go to that chair. And here, and I don't, I don't make a big deal about it, but I want my family to know that that's where Dad talks to Jesus. That's where Dad gets after it and seeking after Jesus. You know, it's, I think it's really funny that it just encourages me all the time is my daughter loves getting in that chair. She loves getting in that chair, and I think it's because that's the chair she knows daddy goes after Jesus. Man, you want to disciple your family? Let your family see you read the Word of God. Let your family see and hear you pray. Shame on you if the people in your home have never heard you pray out loud. Well, I don't know what to say, Brian. You just talk. You talk all day with your buddies, right? Talk about Jesus. Let me ask you another question. Do you talk about Jesus? Do you talk about Jesus in your home? Do you talk about what he's doing in your life? Do, do you, what do you talk about more? Do you talk about politics or Jesus more? Do you talk about sports or Jesus more? Do you talk about your hobbies or Jesus more? Because here's the thing, whether you know it or not, the people around you know what you like. They know what you love. Because what you love, you talk about. Some of you men don't talk, so you must not love anything. That's cool too. What is it? I heard somebody say this week, man, they don't talk much, but once you get them talking about something they love, they won't shut up. 
Let what you talk about be Jesus. Does your family talk about Jesus? Men, you want to disciple your family? You want to disciple your family? You want to disciple your wife, men? Here's, here's, here's one practical, practical thing you can do this week. Sit down in front of your wife or riding in the car with your kids or if your children are out of your home and they're older, you call them and you, you ask this question. You ready? What's God teaching you right now? Simple question. What's God teaching you right now? And then let them talk. You don't have to give them the answer. Just disciple them. Just let them talk. And then here's what the next question is. How can I pray for you? That's how you disciple your family. That's how you disciple your family. That's how you disciple other people. And that's what we're called to do. As we're called to lead, we're called to disciple, we're called to love lavishly. We're called to be encouraging and empowering. We're called to be accountable and take responsibility for our own actions and the actions around us. And then we're called to disciple. And the first line, the first people you should be disciple are the people in your home. And if you're single and you're in this room, you're like, well, I don't have, you have someone that's close to you, whether it be somebody you work with, a neighbor, there's somebody that you talk to on a regular basis and you're called to disciple them. And here's the first line. Ask them, what's God teaching you? And how how can I pray for you? That's what we're called to do, man. Go back to First Peter, though. You say, but I'm, I'm failing at it, right? I'm failing at it. Life just gets so busy. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. I mean, that's a fact. And you're just so busy, and you're like, man, I'm failing. Man, family, devo- oh, family devotions, we don't do family devotions. Y'all, at our house, every night for two hours, we sit on the floor and read the Bible around candles and hum and pray. Um, you don't do that. Our family, de- our family devotions are a complete disaster. I have two teenage boys. They're constantly bringing, look, Dad, let's read this, and they bring up an inappropriate scripture, you know? Like, dude, come on. Our fam- We've never had great family devotions, have we? But you know what we do? We constantly talk about Jesus. We constantly talk about him in our home. And you say, well, I'm failing. I, I, I don't know. What to- here's, the, here's the good news. It says that if we humble ourselves and we submit under the almighty God and we seek after Jesus, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Though your home and your life may not be what you think it should be right now, men, or you know it's where it's not supposed to be, it's time to step up, humble yourself before a living God, confess your sins openly, and call on Him and ask Him to restore, confirm, and strengthen you, establish you. If your marriage is in trouble, if your marriage is in trouble, it's time to humble yourself before a living God and repent and let him, let him, not you, let him restore, confirm, and strengthen and establish you. Men, if it's not your marriage, if it's your home, if it's your workplace, it's time for you to get before a living God and humble yourself. Humble yourself before the almighty hand of God and allow him to restore, confirm, and strengthen you and establish you. Because here's the thing, men. This is what we struggle with. This is what we struggle with. I'm going to shock everybody real quick. I'm not a woman. It's 2024, y'all. I'm not, I don't know how women think. I don't. I know how I think, and I'm a man. So here, here's, here's my struggle. Ready? I constantly want to take it back from God. I constantly want to fix it myself. I constantly want to do it myself. I, I constantly want to be... I've messed up this family. We're going to start doing family devotions. We're going to start doing... Shut up and listen to Scripture. All right, you know? And it don't work. Because God just sits and laughs. He's like, you cute little guy. You think somehow you can do what only I can do. My responsibility is to confess my sins, seek after him in prayer, and those that are around me, let them openly see me doing that. That's how I lead. I lead them to the foot of the cross. 
That's where I lead them. I lead them to the foot of the cross. As your pastor, this is where I want to lead you. Not following me. Not, I want to lead you to the foot of the cross. Because I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and you're a sinner in need of a Savior. So I ask you, in this imperfect series, would you be willing to admit your imperfections? And step up, men, step up. And say, if there's anything I can do to lead, I can lead my family into repentance. Because I need to repent. Here's the crazy thing. They're probably going to forgive you. More than likely, they already have. You really don't need their forgiveness. You need the Savior's forgiveness. Because it says very quickly here, He will restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. So as we end service, next week we're going to talk about grandparents and aunts and uncles and we're going to talk about different roles in the family but we end the day talking about the men in your family men you're called to lead the most important person you're called to lead is lead yourself you you say well I want to be the man of this house humble yourself before the Lord and live a life worthy of following live a life of integrity and honesty before the Lord Here's the other thing, man. I want to tell you, this is the hardest thing I've ever tried to do, is leading myself in this family. I told y'all at the beginning, I'm not a good father, I'm not a good husband, I'm not a good pastor, I'm not a good leader. All I am is a good, you know, I think I'm a good repenter. But I think when you read scripture, like we've been studying Psalms on Wednesday night, and we talk about David, and how David was a God, man after God's own heart, and he committed adultery, and he and he sinned and he killed David was horrible right you're like how was David a man after God's own heart because I think David did something really well you know what David did really well David repented very well David was honest let that be said about us men let that be said about us let's be the men we're called to be let's lead our families let's lead our neighborhoods let's lead this church let this church be a church known of men who lead. Where do we lead, Brian? We lead to the foot of the cross to show the world that our hope is in him, not us. It's in him. Would you stand? Father God, I pray in these next few moments as this song is sung over us that we as men, we, we repent or we fall short. Lord, I fall so short. Lord, I, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry to you, Jesus. I'm so sorry to the people in this room that I've sinned against. I am so sorry, Jesus. But Lord, I want to lavishly love the people around me. I want to be encouraging and empowering. Lord, I, I want to be responsible for what you've given me. And I, I want to lead people to the cross and disciple them so that they can experience your love and grace in freedom in you. Father, now as we do business with you, I pray that we are open and we're honest before you, Lord.